Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're located, and welcome to Nautel's webinar on FM single frequency networks. Uh, welcome to Halifax, Nova Scotia, the shores of St. Margaret's Bay, where it's an absolutely beautiful, gorgeous day up here in Nova Scotia. I'm Chuck Kelly. I am joined today by Philip Schmidt, one of the research engineers here at Nautel. Good morning, or good afternoon, Philip. Hello, hello. Glad to have you with us. Uh, Philip's done an awful lot of work on SFMs, that we both have, and uh, we're very excited to share some cool stuff with you today to understand why single frequency networks, to explain the theory and the challenges behind SFMs. We have a live demonstration uh, configured in our engineering uh, facility where we're going to be able to let you see live what's actually going on in, a, in an SFM and why the challenges are so high. And we're also very, very fortunate to be joined by Mr. John Ioannidis, who's coming to us live from, from Munich, Germany. Uh, he's a, a, an engineer operating in Saloniki, Greece, and has a per first-hand experience with a number of SFNs and can explain the differences he's seen in these SFNs. And we're actually going to talk about the impact of adding HD radio to the whole equation. What happens when you throw that into the mix? And we're going to take your questions. And, and to that point, um, you'll notice in the, in the webinar viewer software that you've got online at this point that there is a place for questions. So when you think of a question, add that question in there. And at the end of the webinar, in roughly 30 or 40 minutes, we will start taking questions and do our very best to, uh, to, to answer those for you and, uh, and uh, see if we can't get a little feedback from the industry. A little history on Nautel. We are 42 years old just as of a couple of weeks ago. We started in actually 1969, but our first AM transmitters, our first broadcast transmitters came out in about 1972 or so. And uh, you can see here the founders of Nautel. Uh, the three guys in front are actually the gentlemen that founded the organization. And what makes you not tell pretty darn unique is that those guys are still involved in the organization today. And that's, that's very special. And we've grown just a tad on the right-hand side last year. This is the, uh, the facility in Nova Scotia where we are located right now. And some of the, of the staff um, of the organization there. We also have another facility in Bangor, Maine, as well as people located uh, throughout the United States as well. Our product families include the NX series of AM transmitters, also known as medium wave, that run from 25 kilowatts to 2 megawatts. We have the NV series of FM transmitters from 3.5 kilowatts up to 88 kilowatts. And we have the VS series, the newest series of Nautile transmitters, which we'll be highlighting today a little bit that operate from 300 watts to 2.5 kilowatts. And all of these product lines are kind of tied together by the control system that is the advanced user interface. And we'll be utilizing that AUI today as we explain SFN. So why do people want SFNs in the first place? Well, if a station has two or more FM transmitters and is operating at the same frequency with exactly the same programming, and intends to have overlapping coverage areas, they need an SFM. Things need to be synchronized. Um, SFMs provide for a more efficient use of spectrum, and they allow listeners to drive long distances and not change the tuning on the radio. And it also allows stations to link the station identity to frequency. And I, and I threw a logo up here uh, of a station, not necessarily that they're running an SFM, but to, to, to indicate that that radio stations oftentimes in their logo, in their materials, even in the way that they express themselves, the frequency is part of that. And if you have uh, a number of different transmitters that aren't synchronized, well, that identity kind of goes out the window a bit. So there's, there's multiple uh, reasons why you might want to have an SFN. Philip? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, the first thing would be just to fix holes in your coverage. Uh, that could be due to terrain shielding, or it could be even nulls in your main transmitter antenna and whatnot. There could be various reasons as to why you do not have sufficient coverage in certain areas. Another interesting scenario would be uh, imagine a long, unbroken coverage area, such as a highway, if you wanted to make sure you can cover that. Now you could uh, tune to the same station for all your travels. Um, 
or certainly if you just want to create a large coverage area from many smaller transmitters. So let's let's show some examples of this. Here is a uh, a mythical, a hypothetical <laughs> example right here on St. Margaret's Bay, Knoxville is located here in Hackett's Cove, where we have a main transmitter near Hubbard's, Nova Scotia, and a uh, uh, again a hypothetical booster transmitter near Chester, Nova Scotia, um, and there is terrain blockage here. So this this station is actually covering an area that we might otherwise be able to cover, but aren't because of the terrain blockage. But this little transmitter, while providing the additional coverage creates an interference zone here where the signal strengths of the two transmitters coming from the main and the booster transmitter are approximately equal. Here's an analysis of how you might look at the coverage analysis of a road. Uh, this is a terrain map showing Nova Scotia. Again, we're, we're looking at Halifax. It is here the, the main city in the area. Nottel is located here on St. Margaret's Bay. And there's a big highway that eventually becomes the Trans-Canadian Highway that goes up to Truro and then across to Moncton. And, uh, and suppose we wanted, hypothetically, to have coverage that direction. What we could do is we'll draw a map over here showing a main transmitter's hypothetical coverage operating out of Halifax. And you can see there the road that we want to try to cover. And you can see that the coverage kind of gets some of it, but there's big blockage areas here on areas of the Trans-Canadian Highway. We'd like to have coverage. So we can throw in another transmitter. And so we, we, we cite that transmitter so as to, uh, to take maximum advantage of the terrain shielding. And this is really the job of a, an RF consulting engineer. There are some consultants who can sit there and do this and to maximize the coverage while minimizing where the, the size of the interference zones and putting them, hopefully, where people aren't. Exactly. And then we can look at the interference zone, which is actually created in here. And there's some additional interference zones up here. And you can see that we've actually done a pretty good job of matching the coverage of the, of the two transmitter sites and, and maximizing the coverage on the road. Additionally, we can create one major station uh, utilizing train coverage that uses the same frequency over a large area. So for instance, here in southwestern Colorado, uh, we've got uh, the, the city of Durango over here. We can put a station on the air in Farmington, New Mexico. We can throw another station up here near, uh, oh, I guess near Montrose, Colorado, and another hypothetical station off on the eastern slope of Colorado. And you can see how the coverage of those three stations would go together. Theoretically, most of the time, you could, wherever you'd be driving, you'd be in coverage of those three stations. It would be impossible, in fact, to do it with one. The other important thing, aside from the station and identity, is that the frequency allocation is, 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 is easier. Um, if you used three different frequencies, those frequencies would be unable to be used for other purposes. This is a much more efficient allocation of spectrum. So the SFM basic concept is to optimize everything, synchronize everything. Yes, uh, Chuck threw an interesting little uh, picture in there. If it's not all synchronized, <laughs> it could be a headache. That's right. <laughs> uh, but he certainly, yes, you want to uh, synchronize a carrier frequency. The reason for that is you, we, we want to minimize the beating between the two RF carrier frequencies. If you don't do that, you'll see on a spectrum analyzer, your entire spectrum go up and down as the two carriers go in and out of phase. Particularly as you get closer to the same uh, same power level. Well, exactly. Location. And that's the worst case, exactly, equal yep. power levels. However, you don't have to synchronize their phases because a phase will change throughout the terrain anyway. So you travel a few feet and your phase is different anyway. So really what we need to lock is just the frequency. That's right. why we use our GPS 10 megahertz lock to make sure that we have a solid carrier frequency lock. But we also lock the pilot frequency and phase. The pilot frequency is locked to the same 10 megahertz, but the phase is locked to one PPS coming off that same GPS receiver. Exactly. So we just make sure that the phase of that 19 kilohertz is always at uh, zero degrees or a programmable amount when you have that one PPS pulse. Okay. And then we've got to make sure that the audio content, amplitude, and phase is exactly the same. I, I can't stress enough how important that point is. We'll get to it a little bit because we're going to do a little bit of a sensitivity analysis, if you will. But it's unbelievable how closely matched those levels must be to get acceptable performance from your SFM. And also, you should have the same exact information and the same 
configuration of your RDS and or SCAs on your station. So the problem is interference zones. As we said, where the coverage areas overlap and the ratios of signal strengths approach unity, the signal quality is affected. Suppose I have my first transmitter over here on this hill, my second transmitter, my booster transmitter over here on this mountain, it would create an interference zone somewhere around here. And that's the problem, is the interference zone. If, if, if you don't have perfect synchronization of these two transmitters, that area is going to sound really, really horrible. So if the RF carriers are not frequency synchronized, terrible distortion and noise will result. If the audio levels are not exactly the, main, the same, the noise floor increases dramatically with a white noise, which, which varies with the level of the audio. It's almost a frying pan noise, really. If the pilots are not synchronized, the pilot detector and the receiver will switch back and forth, and this will be audio audible in the stereo signal. If the audio phase is not synchronized, distortion will result. And if everything, the audio, the pilot, and the carrier are all synchronized, this signal will sound like a multipath condition. And that's a really important under, point to understand. Going back to our picture of, of, of the first transmitter and the second booster transmitter over here, if instead that second booster was actually a really, really big mirror electrically, it would create multipath in this spot. But the, it, the carrier characteristics, the modulation characteristics, the pilot phase, all of that would be exactly the same because it's just a reflection. So the best we can hope for in the interference zone is multipath. If we get everything right, the best we can hope for is multipath. And it's very important for people to understand that. However, the effects of multipath are far less audible than the effects of an unsynchronized SFM. And we will talk about that. Yeah, particularly many uh, car receivers um, have mitigation um, algorithms in place to mitigate multipath effects. Yep. So, Phil, talk about this. We're talking about the UD or DU ratios, the desired to undesired ratio. Right. It's fine to say that we need to mesh interference area, but we wanted to provide a little bit of guidance to exactly what that means. How closely do we have to match in time? How closely do we have to be matched in signal uh, ratios, whatnot? So later on, we'll show you a demonstration of what we have in the lab here. And using such a system, we've measured the impact on the audio by varying two factors uh, on two transmitters. And that is the, the time difference between the two, as well as the relative power levels of the two. Mm -hmm. So the worst case that you, that you could have is if the power levels are identical. In that case, you have to be very, very closely time aligned. That would be down here where the uh, desired to undesired ratio is zero. Right. You can still make it sound okay, uh, but there could still be minimal impacts. Um, but as soon as uh, one of the transmitters receives signal strength from one of the transmitters gains in power, we can tolerate more time delay difference. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have a time delay difference of 6 dB, or I've said uh, 14, uh, uh, or 6 microseconds, sorry. Yep. That's this line here. We want to make sure that we have at least a 10 dB higher received signal strength from one of the transmitters or the other. And to manage all that is really the challenge. Um, this is what uh, Chuck mentioned, a, an RF consulting engineer. That's the information that they should use for their simulations to highlight where the interference areas are in your region. Okay, excellent. Explain constant delay lines. So this is a really cool graphic. I like this. <laughs> well, there's just a little uh, MATLAB simulation that I've set up there uh, a little while ago. And I like to do animations, so uh, I've done that. Assume you have a main and a boost, and I believe I set them about 15 kilometers apart, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And let's assume we hold off the transmission of the booster with respect to the main by a little bit. Right. If they were both sent out at the same time, then the signal pings that I have here would be exactly in the middle. That would be where the two signals would be at the, at the same time. Right. If you hold off the booster a little bit, as shown in this simulation, you will get a curved line where they are at the same time. This is the region where we can mitigate interference rate areas. And depending on the amount of back off, time back off that you do on your booster, you can control where that line falls. Mm -hmm. So go to the next slide. Okay. So assume you've done your RF coverage analysis using your tools. You figure out where your interference zones are, going back to our hypothetical, hypothetical example. In this case, we've got interference zones in here and over here. And, yep. Exactly. What you want to do is you want to best find a time offset such that these interference zones the signal would arrive at the same time in those regions. 
You won't be able to get this for all regions, but hopefully you can shift the good interference zones in regions where it matters and push the ones where you cannot meet those timing requirements in regions where you don't matter. Exactly. Okay. So our approach here is to synchronize everything. I want to back up just a second. As long as I've been in this business for, for working on 40 years here, um, people have been talking about SFMs. And every time a new technology came out, they said, finally, SFMs are going to work. And you know what? They didn't. It, it, the promise wasn't fulfilled. People was like selling snake oil or something. But the reason that this now works is because everything is digital. It was impossible for anyone to synchronize an analog system and make it exactly the same. But with digital, we can do this. So the audio is synchronized using an uncompressed digital AES EV STL. The transmit audio levels are locked to exactly the same um, level. And we're using digital exciters where that's just a, a number at that point. The, the gain is a number. We use the AES EBU inputs on the Nautel digital exciter. The carriers and the pilots are synchronized using GPS. And, and in our exciter, the, the pilot and the stereo generator are synchronized to the same frequency standard as the carrier. So the 10 megahertz serves the whole process. And the deviation is locked digitally. There's no variation possible. You can see here how important synchronization is. Um, the link between the sites, when we talk about a microwave link or an STL, the only key things are it must be a digital AES EBU. It must be uncompressed because if there's any differences between the, the, the signal on the, the uh, two different sites, that will be a huge uh, difference in the performance in the, in the interference zone. And it must have a stable propagation time. Even if you turn off the STL and turn it back on again, it should have the same uh, uh, propagation time from one to the other. And there's a number of manufacturers that make studio to transmitter links. Um, John Ioannidis uh, is with us uh, at the airport in Munich, Germany. John, your company, DTS, manufactures one of these STLs. Absolutely. Hello to all. Yes. The, the, there are many, several uh, points we have to mention to, to have to be uh, very careful adjust when you design a digital wing for uh, broadcast applications. The first, of course, is the latency. So we have carefully designed uh, a range of microwave links from 5 gigs to 38 gigs. Um, the total latency for each system is uh, less than 5 milliseconds the total. So right. this is a very low latency system. Very high, the second point is the very high audio quality. So we have designed an audio interface that is going to 48 kilohertz, 24 bits, uncompressed of course, up to 96 kilohertz and 24 also bits. So we are talking for extremely high audio quality. The third point okay. is, uh, of course, the adjust. The third point is that uh, there is no need any uh, adjustment for this system. So it's almost plug and play. What the two uh, or more interfaces can do, can talk each other and calculate the internal uh, latency of the link and the audio interfaces, the AED converters, and SYNC converters, and so on. So uh, when the, 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 the system um, is ready, um, we have already calculated all the points to zero delay to zero latency. So consider that the old points, the, the studio, the site one, two, three, or four, are zero synchronized. It means that there is no delay, audio delay between. So That's right. only then to then we have only to calculate uh, the, the the delay that creates from the distance. This is the only point you have to calculate and adjust in the audio delay of the uh, this is not excited, probably. That's that's perfect, John. Uh, Thank you so much. The, okay. the new thing is that we are going very soon to release a new series that is going to um, uh, 800 megahertz to 96. That'll be very valuable, particularly yeah, in the U.S. market. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, very good, John. Thank you. And we're going to have John back in a couple of minutes to talk about his experience using these kinds of links in the Athens, Greece market. So here's a typical block diagram of, a, of an SFM system. So you have, in this case, we're using our VS series of transmitters. You have the AES-CBU signal coming from the studio or from an STL. 
being split into two identical streams. We've got a GPS receiver that has both 10 megahertz and one PPS outputs driving the exciter. Uh, we have an STL. Again, it could be any of the various STLs we just talked about. We have another exciter with the aes -EBU signal going into it. Again, a GPS receiver synchronizing that. And at that point, the RF coming out with the frequency, the phase, the audio modulation, modulation index, everything is perfectly synchronized in every aspect. And, and this is a very robust type of system. What do you need? You need two Nautel FM exciters. I should mention that everything since the M50 at Nautel has included all the functionalities for SFMs. You don't have to buy external time delays. You don't have to buy external pilot synchronization units. It's all built in to the, the, uh, the Nautel system. So you do need to have uh, two GPS receivers, an AES-EBU splitter, and as I mentioned, an uncompressed digital STL with AES-EBU input and output. So what's built into the Nautel NV and VS today? Uh, the the no-cost no, no SFM functionality is standard in the NV and the VS, including the phase lock pilot, 10 megahertz and 1 PPS TTL level outputs, uh, or inputs rather, uh, built in a micro adjust time delay uh, in, that is adjustable in increments of one microsecond, and you will require a synchronous link as we discussed, uh, an uncompressed digital link with a known and stable propagation time. So now we're going to go to a demonstration of an SFN which has been built by Philip in our engineering laboratory. He has there an audio processor a single audio processor, this is really important, a single audio processor, because if you have two different audio processors, you have the potential for two different sets of audio levels. Even slight changes will make big differences. So that audio processor is providing a split AES feed between two VS300 transmitters. We're summing together the RF monitor outputs and a coupler, and then that is driving both a spectrum analyzer and a, an FM receiver, and, um, and, and so we will be able to demonstrate exactly what's going on. Here's a photograph of what's going on right now in our engineering facility. It's a lot neater on the diagram, Phil, I have to say. <laughs> so let's go and take a look at the, um, the AUI on one of the two transmitters. So here on this AUI, we have, we have the ability to set the, uh, the pilot level. We can turn on the one PFPS sync functionality. And you mentioned that if the 10 megahertz is present, it automatically takes it. Exactly. Um, and then we can adjust the pilot sync phase here. And in this case, we've enabled the audio delay unit, and it is set for one microsecond delay at the moment. And uh, we can also look over here that the audio input level is set at minus 4 dB full scale. Exactly, which is matched to the audio processor's over point. That's right. So we've got two transmitters. They're configured the same exactly the same, and now let's look at the spectrum analyzer. And you've got the spectrum analyzer set at the moment, Phil, I believe, for the RF carrier. Exactly. So maybe I'll take over at this point. Sure. So we've got the two transmitters all being combined together here, and maybe the easiest way to show that to you is by just by moving one of the uh, transmitters off in frequency. Okay. So I have done that here. So you can see the two VS transmitters producing RF here, same modulation input, so you can see them dancing the same way. Yep. But of course, we're talking about an SFN here, so let's move them back over to 98.1. And here we go. There is some averaging that is built into the spectrum analyzer, so sometimes it doesn't instantaneously change. Exactly. But the interesting thing that I wanted to highlight to you here is right now both transmitters are set for a one microsecond delay. Right. If I change one of the transmitters to a 10 microsecond delay, which equates to, I would say, about three kilometers, two miles uh, in, on, in terrain, see what happens here. So I've just added this in here, and we should be able to, oh, wait, I set it to one microsecond, it's about 10. We're just off by an order of magnitude. There we go. Oh, look at that. And you can see a cone effect happening. Exactly. A nice symmetric um, FM spectrum now has these, these cone effects in it. And that is your multipath effect. Mm -hmm. If in your interference zones your two signals are not the same, this is what your receiver will see. Yeah. And this will be particularly bad if 
if your noise floor is reaching into those nulls, because then that will uh, contribute to the overall noise effect in there as well. Absolutely. It's certainly not a good thing. Nope. And uh, 10 microseconds, again, it's not a whole lot, um, but you will start to see these issues even uh, even at uh, five microseconds, whatnot. So now you've returned it to the standard, everything's in sync now. Exactly. And I've had a, an FM receiver set up for this whole demo as well. We were hoping to stream some audio to you uh, so you could actually listen to the effects of what all of this does. Unfortunately, the um, coding effects in our uh, webinar system here made it entirely uh, unlistenable uh, to really hear all of this. So we'll hope, we're hoping to make, make some offline recordings available to you. Okay. So right now, um, I've switched the spectrum analyzer to um, an, our, an audio modulation, or a, 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 the MPX spectrum. We're actually looking at from DC out to 100 kilohertz, so the composite baseband. We're looking at that right now, and you can see the L plus R here out to 15 kilohertz. You can see the 19 kilohertz pilot quite, quite clean. You can see the 38 kilohertz double sideband suppressed carrier for the L minus R, and a relatively clean baseband off to the right. And this is 10 dB per division. Um, and therefore, that from top to bottom here, we're looking at 100 dB. As you we were talking here, I've already changed one of the settings, and you can see the noise floor coming up yep. already. Looks pretty bad now. And what I've done is I've just simply changed the audio gain, the audio input gain, by 0.1 dB. Uh, just one of the transmitters. So that what exactly. you're saying is there's a tenth of a dB mismatch in audio levels and in, in, in thus in, in modulation index between the two transmitters. Exactly. So with this, it, it's still listenable. You can probably already hear some of the artifacts. It's not too, too bad yet. So let's increase that difference. Uh, so even going to four to uh, 0.2 dB delta. Okay. I've made the change now here. And it's going to start to come. Oh, yeah, much worse. Exactly. And you can also see on the bottom, the bottom graph gives you a, a waterfall plot Mm -hmm. of that spectrum. So you can see over time how often it, it splurts over. And you can see yeah, that you the can very see over here on the right hand side you can see splatter. Exactly. The very discrete splatters. And that's a bacon frying sound that essentially happens every time one of those splatters happens. Yeah. And we just had the, the audio went away. That's why it got really clean for a moment because there was only one signal on the screen. Nothing to exactly. have IMD between. We only had that pilot there for that time. Well exactly. If you, if you have no modulation then it doesn't matter whether you have it synchronized or not. So let's make it look one dB different. All right, a one dB difference. Here we go. Now, what the, the significance of one dB is kind of interesting because theoretically, one dB is approximately the minimum difference that the human ear can hear in terms of loudness. So, imagine you're trying to adjust an analog system with a little green screwdriver. I mean, who can adjust a little green, uh, an analog system amplitude? to within a tenth of a dB. I don't know people that can do that in an analog system. You can see here, there's absolutely no signal to noise ratio. It sounds terrible. And we'll make those recordings available to anyone who's interested. Okay. Okay. Now you've returned it to perfect again. And we have uh, what looks like a very good baseband, even though we've got two identical transmitters summing together. Right. Exactly. Now, of course, they're both at the same power level. Whenever you have a difference like that, if one of the power levels is slightly higher, you'll start to reduce the effects. As soon as one of them becomes dominant, that effect becomes less. But exactly. if they're equal power levels, this is the worst possible case here. Okay. Okay. So let's let me uh, let's show everybody how what what we've been doing when we adjust these things. We'll just go back into the AUI for a moment. So in order to change the the level, you've been saying, for instance. 5 dB instead of minus 5 on one of the transmitters as opposed, and now we would go back over here and we would look at this again, and you can see it's returned to awful. Exactly. And we can come back over here to the AUI, return it to... Well, why don't you do something different first? Okay. Give it a minus 5 and reduce it to power level. Oh, okay. Well, I have yeah. a general tab here, and let's say yeah. I cut it in half and see if that starts to clean up our spectrum. Let's do that. I mean, we can play with the system, may as well. Sure. Okay, so now we've reduced the power of one of our transmitters to 25 watts, and now we'll switch back over here and look at our spectrum analyzer, and it shouldn't be quite as bad. No, it isn't quite as bad. Yep, so what's happened is the, the, because the ratio is now 6 dB different in the voltage domain, right? Yeah. Um, so we, we are now looking at a much cleaner baseband, and if I go back here and fix 
the AUI in terms of the audio level. So I would come back over here to main audio and reset this to minus four and hit apply. And now I go back again to the spectrum analyzer and now we're back to perfect. And that really doesn't make any difference whether or not I'm at 25 watts or 50 watts. The perfect exactly. is perfect. Okay. All right. So let's carry on here and let's uh, go back over to here because we still have people's questions. A reminder for everyone, if you have questions about what you're seeing here, please do type them into the question box on the, on the viewer, and we will attempt at the end of this uh, presentation to address your questions as best we can. So let's see here. Next up, we talk about how we calculate system timing. And, and really, it's just simply figuring out the differential length. If this is the interference zone, here's our main transmitter. Length B is the difference from the main or the distance physically between the main transmitter and the interference zone. And distance A is all the way over to the uh, uh, second transmitter, uh, the propagation time of that, plus the distance back to the interference zone. You subtract those out. You calculate it, multiply it by the factor 3.34. So in this case, the differential distance was 6 kilometers multiplied by 3.34, the factor, very simple to understand. And, and disregarding the electrical propagation time of an STL or what have you, the, the propagation delay in this case would be 20 microseconds, and you would simply dial an extra 20 microseconds of delay into the exciter and the main transmitter side, and that would provide audio synchronization at the, at the, um, uh, in the interference zone. So if you're installing an SFM, you want to set both exciters to lock to the external 10 megahertz reference frequency, adjust the exciter transmitter site 1 for proper modulation, um, set the exciter transmitter site 2 for the exact same AES EBU gain as recorded from transmitter site number 1, Enter the calculated differential delay of the AES EBU. We just talked about how to come up with that. And then you can go into the interference zone and you can fine adjust the delay to minimize the uh, distortion that occurs um, at a, a particular spot within the interference zone. Or another possibility is to do a fine tuning that I've come up with a little, a little uh, trick. And that is go out into the interference zone late at night um, after midnight, preferably, I suppose, with an RPU, a function generator, a scope, and an FM receiver with a Yagi. And the idea here is that you feed the function generator. Suppose you're going to use a 100 hertz square wave. Uh, you feed that into the RPU, which is fed to the studio and is actually put on the air, the hence wanting to do it after midnight. And, and then the uh, STL sends it over to transmitter B. And now you're in the middle of the interference zone. You've got approximately the same RF fixed signal strength from the two sites. You hook up the FM receiver and, and send it to a scope. The output of the FM receiver goes to a scope. The same square wave that is function that is going to the RPU is also triggering the scope. So the, the, the signal you see on the screen is now very stable. And you should be able to see two sets of zero crossings um, and that vary with the timing between transmitter A and transmitter B. Then you can go into the, if you've got an internet connection, you can go right into the the uh, delay settings in transmitter A through the AUI and adjust it as you speak in order to synchronize those two zero crossings and that ties your system up and, and, and makes it work perfectly. What an Autel synchronous FM system isn't, it isn't a system. It is rather a portfolio, a portfolio of solutions used to create a reliable and high performance system. You can't over, uh, underestimate uh, uh, or overestimate the, the importance of the RF design process to figure out the relative power levels, the types of antennas, uh, the terrain effects on the coverage, so as to locate the interference zones um, uh, in places where people don't spend a lot of time and to minimize the size of those zones. And, and, and that's a job for RF consulting engineers, and we're not them. What we're doing is providing the tools so that when there are interference zones, the performance is as high as possible. So now I'd like to invite John Ioannidis again in from Munich Airport and to talk about an installation of an SFM you did for KISS 92.9 in Athens. John? 
Oh, hello again. It's a really strange situation there because there is, uh, as you see on the map, the studio is uh, about uh, 10 kilometers away from the site A, that is the main uh, transmitter. Yeah, the site A. Kilowatt. Mm -hmm. yeah, say, uh, site A is a 20 kilowatt transmitter, and right. the hotspot is 12 kilometers away. So, so this so distance here is 12 kilometers, and only. when you say hotspot, you mean the interference zone. Probably, yeah. Yep. In the other side, the side B, the distance from the interference area it is about 38 kilometers. And the, okay. transmitter, the transmission power inside B is 1 kilowatt only. So it, it, it is difficult. The, 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 the plan, it was difficult from the beginning. And, and the reason they have to have this booster is that there is train, there's no real place in all of, of Athens that you could locate an FM transmitter and not get terrain blockage in some part of the city of Athens or another. Exactly. Okay. So what we did is install um, uh, Nautil M50s, uh, two M50s and uh, radio link, um, the microwave radio link. Uh, yep. It was... Uh, I guess, of course, we found a different uh, product there. The customer had already buy from other manufactured products with external yep. um, uh, audio delays, with external 19-kilo um, sync, and um, so on. The, the Pretty expensive the, system. And it's not only expensive, Chuck, but it was um, unstable because all those cables are out of the box and uh, there are a lot of RF power in the area, so it wasn't it wasn't really a mess. It was really a mess. No no stability. So yep. it was impossible to adjust any parameter. It was really unstable. What we do is we we have already removed it and replaced with M50s with our audio interfaces and then concert and. Uh, it was about an hour to adjust the SFM. What we did, we, we only calculate the distance between site B and the interference area, we call it hotspot, and we uh, delay all the program in site B by the amount of this delay. So it wasn't about an hour. The, the uh, result, it is uh, very stable now. Uh, of course, it is very, um, uh, you know, it's very clean. I mean, in the area of the hotspot, it's very clean. But the, the good result for them is, uh, for the customer, is a listener to do not change the radio. I mean, to hear uh, the, the program and the songs like all the other places. So, um, in this case, the, the sound is really clean. It's stereo with RDS. So, yeah, and that RDS point is very important. In Europe, John, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but in Europe, uh, RDS is very important. And um, and you were saying that before, in the unstable system that had other equipment, um, that the RDS was often not visible, simply because there's so much intermodulation distortion created by the main signals that was covering up the low-level injection RDS signal. In the first situation we have to, um, to, to, to recover, it's that there was not only there wasn't a stereo sound, so wow. who's talking about RBS? Wow. So it wasn't even good enough to do stereo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate it very much. And, and you're, you're, you, you've talked to the management of KISS FM, and they're very happy with the performance of the SFM. Exactly. And, uh, you know, the price level like, was really the hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you, John. Thanks so much for joining us. Afaristo <laughs> Poli. Okay, so the conclusion of, of the part of the, the webinar we're doing today on, on synchronous FM, the analog side, is that it's practical today, and interference zones can be minimized. Interference zone distortion is similar to multipath. Key factors include the precise synchronization of modulation levels. And single frequency network can provide significant benefits to FM broadcasters as well as to spectrum regulators. Now, as we promised, we've got extra credit today, SFNs for HD radio. When you throw HD radio, the OFDM carriers, into the mix, what happens with, um, with the, the signal? So, Phil, we'll, you've done some research on this. Absolutely. Now with uh, SFNs for HD radio on the underlying IBOX signal standards being all the, the, the hot talk these days, um, it certainly makes sense to look at that. 
initially when you first look at uh, a multi-carrier system such as uh, IBOC for HD radio, um, one thing that's always being pitched is the, that it's so much more easy to get an SFN running with a digital system like that. And the reason for that is that A, it relaxes the timing margins required in your inter interference zone. Where previously we were talking about, as I demonstrated earlier, 10 microsecond difference uh, causing a multipath distortion. Well, now we have 40 to 75 microseconds, depending on your situation um, uh, of play available, which really allows you to have to mitigate larger interference areas. Mm -hmm. But the second important issue as well is that you have relaxed desired undesired ratios. Whereas for FM, if you have a, a, a station in the same frequency, you really want to have 30 dB of separation or more, else you will have interference on uh, the FM. Unless you're perfectly synchronized as we were talking about. Right, unless you're perfectly synchronized. IBOC, on the other hand, can live with a 4 dB difference. It can, if you have a noise floor just 4 dB below the IBOC carriers, you will still have perfect audio. Mm -hmm. So those two factors make it a lot easier for planning uh, single frequency networks and uh, really make it a lot easier. But today we still have to deal with a hybrid signal. Well, that's exactly it. Um, the reason why we, we cannot simply put an IBOC only booster in the field is that if you were to do that, you run the risk of flooding a traditional FM receiver with too much IBOC. Sure. Most receivers are designed with a 6 dB first adjacent desired and desired ratio. Um, so if, if, if you just put an IBOC transmitter itself, it's easy to have 20, 30 dB of IBOC and hardly any FM at all. And it's highly receiver dependent as to what that will do, but you will lose some FM receivers in that situation. Sure, and you'll get, you'll get interference from the digital to the analog because the receiver is mobile and you can't control the relative signal levels in all locations. Exactly, so you have to maintain at least some degree of the FM signal within your hybrid booster uh, content. Mm -hmm. At least make sure that uh, Abiquary has done some tests um, and if you use a zero dB, same parallels between the FM, the IBOC and the booster and that seemed to work relatively well. But we're back to all the requirements of the FM uh, SFN. Yeah. Uh, we must synchronize the IBOC, the FM audio, the FM pilot, RDS, SCAs. Um, it, it's, so we're back to the same problem. So your idea was to encapsulate, to transmit the entire signal as defined by the I and the Q signals. Exactly. And this is a concept that we've presented at NAB 2009, and we certainly have proceedings for that uh, if you're interested. But the, the concept is that um, assume you have your RF signal um, and you were to shift it back to zero hertz, take out the carrier frequency. Just do a, 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 a mental shift in the frequency domain down to zero hertz. Mm -hmm. Now you will be pushing your signal into the negative spectrum area, but with digital signal processing techniques, we can capture that entire signal at baseband at zero hertz in the digital domain. Um, and once we now that we have it all in digital samples, we can now use that to transfer those samples over an IP network, whatnot, and recreate the exact same signal in multiple transmitter locations. Okay. So now we have identical FM modulation, we have our pilotons already synchronized, you don't yep. have to resynchronize it. Sure. All your subcarriers are synchronized, RDS is synchronized, and your IBOC is also there. Now mind you, this is not just for IBOC um, hybrid uh, networks, I mean, it, it, this method is really modulation agnostic, it could work with any other technique as well. For instance, DRM plus. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So here's graphically what you're talking about. It does require a lot of bandwidth. Exactly. So in this case here, let's say we have a main transmitter here. And at the main transmitter, naturally, you have to modulate all the sources. Mm -hmm. Now, in concept, we could potentially move that modulating exciter back to the studio and transfer, you know, fan everything out there. Sure. But you could use the main transmitter's exciter and fan that uh, modulated content out from there. Mm -hmm. So in the case of IBOC, where we have to carry plus or minus 200 kilohertz of bandwidth, and really you want to carry a little bit more, else it's going to be very hard in the DSP domain to take care of that. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking the order of 24 megabits of throughput. Which sounds like a heck of a lot when you're talking about the internet speed I have delivered in my house, but in terms of STLs today, that's not such a big deal. Exactly, that's certainly feasible today. Uh, Mind you, it may not work in all situations, but if you have a clean air path between uh, main and, and, and the booster with maybe a directional antenna into a different um, 
whole as such, mm -hmm. that can certainly work quite quite well. And the difference is you really don't need any modulation anymore at the booster. So no longer do you need well, an extra... You can save a lot of money. Well, exactly. Because you already have the entire signal there. You essentially can feed that right into your directed channel uh, DSP up conversion. So that means and all this area it. here, we don't have to replicate on the other side. This area here operates only in one place, and then that signal is sent to the boosters automatically. Exactly. So you can take those savings and make sure you get yourself a good STL that yep. can handle that. Very good. All right. So explain this graph to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit uh, a handful to explain here, but we wanted to investigate whether the SFN capability of IABOC is really feasible. Um, this was actually before Ibiquity has provided any hooks to create any SFNs whatnot. So this was with our I, IQ over IP concept. Right. And we've performed bit error tests. We have a bit error tester here in the lab where we can uh, monitor the uh, IBOC signal performance. And we've, done, we've varied two IBOC tr transmitters in time as well as in desired to undesired ratio. Yep. So let's say we, we were perfectly time aligned with the blue curve at zero microseconds. And if, if you change the desired to undesired ratio, you can see the bit errors as the signal get, the desired signal gets stronger, you will see the bit error rate drop off. Sure. But as you increase the time differential, the, the bit errors start to increase again. So you can see the different sets of curves as we move out to, let's say, 40 microsecond being the light blue curve, you'll get more bit errors. Mm -hmm. However, even in the worst case there, you're still below the eyeball reception limit. You'll still have good audio. So a receiver is still going to be able to receive HD radio as long as the, the line does not extend above the red line. Exactly. Okay. And we found 75 microseconds on the edge, so I would caution not to push that spec to the limit. Sure. So, so if you're going to get it right for analog, you've got it right for digital. Well, that's exactly the, the moral of the story that we're, that we're getting to. Sure. Okay. So now we've come to the part of the program where we, we take your questions. So I'm going to try to switch on the questions area here and see if there are questions that we can answer here. One second here. All right, looks like we've got several. So how critical is it that both transmitters are operating into antennas with identical polarity? The answer is not so critical because um, it, it actually increases the U to D ratio mm. everywhere, and, and, and um, that, would, that would work. So I would say, no, it's not very critical at all. In fact, exactly. it's not a bad idea if they are that way. Um, thank you for that question. The next question. Um, it says, uh, how does synchronous AM noise affect an SFN when you have amplitude modulation on the FM carrier? Right, and that would mostly be due if you have your uh, carrier frequency not synchronized to 10 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Then the beating of the two uh, will give you a, an AM modulation component. So we want to make sure that you have your... Um, your, fre your frequency locked to 10 megahertz, and yes, as you move across the terrain, you will still have some beating like that, but that is now related to the speed at, that, at which you're moving. If you're constant in one place, you should really have no significant AM distortion mm -hmm. if you're time aligned. Yep. Okay. And we got a greeting from one of our international listeners, but apart from that, I think that's the questions. Now, just because we haven't answered your question doesn't mean we can't. Uh, feel free. To, to send us an email or um, at uh, these, um, well, you can send me an email or the, the next page will give you that information. Here's some different dip additional locations for information. The Nautel Waves newsletter is available at this link. Uh, all the archive versions, if you only caught part of this program and you want to catch the whole thing or tell a friend about it, you can go to www.nautel.com forward slash webinars and we will have this webinar posted uh, within the next couple of days. There's also our YouTube site and our Nautel store that you're welcome to uh, to take a look at. And if there are questions that we haven't answered today, you can talk to one of our uh, wise uh, uh, sales representatives or you can email us, email us at sales at Nautel.com. We've run a little bit over time. We've had an awful lot of fun and an awful lot of good information. I hope you found it useful. And uh, from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Thank you so much for being a part of our webinar. Bye-bye.